Hello, everybody, and welcome. Um, as uh, Seth says, uh, we'll be talking about advanced approaches to nuclear measurement and characterization today. So who are Veolia Nuclear Solutions? So a brief introduction to ourselves and the Veolia group. So as it says on the screen, ecological transformation, that is our purpose. But the Veolia group is huge and we work worldwide. The, the company itself is uh, valued at over 30 billion euros. And the nuclear part of this is just a small part of what we're talking about. But what do we mean by ecological transformation? And that is about putting ecology at the heart of what we do. It's about improving biodiversity. It's about decreasing pollution, probably one of the most well-known parts of Veolia in terms of water processing and prov provision of clean drinking water. It's also about fighting climate change. And we uh, have other parts of our business looking at decarbonisation and, uh, and other areas. And finally, about optimising our resources. So not only about enhancing the circular economy, but also other areas that Veolia work in, including the uh, energy from waste and optimising what we get from the waste and other byproducts of what we do as part of our uh, activities. So who are nu Veolia Nuclear Solutions? Veolia Nuclear Solutions uh, is the nuclear arm of uh, the Veolia Group. We work across three specific peers, the first of which is on-site services, where we deliver facility services and legacy waste management. In particular, what we uh, operate plants on behalf of our customers in uh, France and the US. We undertake decommissioning and dismantling operations, and we undertake nuclear facility remediation. So a lot of that is concerning some of the work that we're doing uh, in Japan and elsewhere. Um, and we also undertake laboratory operations. So in particular, and relating to uh, today's webinar, we um, undertake characterization services, but it doesn't necessarily stop, stop there in that we've got a, a large R&D facility that undertake uh, R&D uh, work at uh, test tube and uh, crucible scales. And finally, we uh, also on site undertake operation and maintenance activities. On the technology stream, we've got uh, remote handling and robotics. And one of the areas, particularly in the UK, that we are uh, most well known for is the robotics and working with uh, Japanese customers on with respect to entering and surveying the uh, Fukushima reactor 2 with a view to retrievals at a later date. We undertake waste treatment, in particular solid and liquid effluents, and we own technologies in these areas. In particular, we uh, own the GML technology when it comes to vitrification, but also we undertake work looking at the filtering and uh, of uh, liquid wastes, uh, iron exchange media in particular being an area of strength. And finally, the, the, in the technology stream is the nuclear measurement and characterization area. It is focused on our laboratory capabilities, but it goes wider than that and about exploiting the uh, technologies that are available today and how we can add value for our customers. The third leg of our uh, work look, is looking at waste treatment. We undertake activities in, uh, with, with our technologies where we've deployed them on site. So GML again, is, a, is an example of that, where we undertake waste treatment activities on behalf of the DOE um, in, uh, in America. We uh, undertake radioactive material processing, again, very much treat related to the waste treatment. Um, we undertake decontamination and asset recovery activities. We have sites in the, uh, in the US in particular where we uh, are undertaking those kinds of activities. And within the wider Veolia group, we also undertake decontamination asset recovery in other, in other spheres, in particular oil and gas. And finally, we've got disposal site management, where in France, we are operating um, low level facilities on behalf of uh, clients, as well as ILW storage facilities. So moving on, clients and partners. So we work across four major geographical areas. So we've got France, the UK, North America and Japan. And what that means is that from a company perspective, we can bring learning from across those different areas for the benefits of uh, our customers in one or other of those different areas. So we can leverage what we're doing and the learning across different spheres. And that works just as much within VNS as it does across our sister companies within Veolia. You will see that uh, we work for the uh, usual 
uh, customers across these areas. So we've got the NDA in the UK, DOV, D D O E, sorry, in the US, and EDF and uh, the CEA in France. So what's the challenge? Why are we interested in uh, characterization and uh, the information that we can get from that characterization? Well, in terms of setting the context from a UK perspective, we're talking about ramping up for decommissioning activities. Yes, the NDA has been undertaking these activities in the UK for, for many years, but we're starting to see moves towards things like continuous reactor decommissioning. We've got 12 Magnox sites across the UK that need decommissioning. We've got another seven AGR sites, and it starts to sound a bit premature we're talking about those, but actually they're starting to come stop generating today. So the need for characterization and other such services is only going to increase as, these, uh, as the overlap between the Magnox sites and the AGR site activities builds. But what are the drivers for our effective nuclear waste processing and disposal? Well, some of it is coming from best practice. How do we ensure that as we go from one site to the other, that we are doing this decommissioning work using the best environmental practices? We've then got drivers for site reuse. You know, we've got new build coming along on the horizon. We've got other activities such as waste processing and where are these actually going to be un undertaken? So some of these sites are now starting to see a future beyond their current use. And we're also seeing others wanting to use those sites for a future in clean energy. And finally, cost. And cost will be a bit of a recurring theme, but value for money is what we're looking at here. And a number of, for those um, on the UK, is about making sure that our taxes and our money is spent in the most efficient manner. The, we've, we spend annually in the UK about three billion pounds when it comes to the NDA's budget. And the Nuclear Liabilities Fund for the AGRs is currently at about 20 billion. So there's a lot of money focused in these areas. And all of this today is about building that processing and disposal capability that we are going to need to meet this mission. So why does this matter? And a lot of this then comes back to waste-led decommissioning. Waste-led decommissioning is about working from the waste backwards, identifying the disposal, understanding what the waste is, understanding the processing options, and then optimizing your decommissioning activities against those. Done correctly, we should see that it optimizes safety, it optimizes the waste route, and it provides clear, best available techniques against which you can make those decisions. It should ultimately lead to cost-effective solutions, and we should, as a result of all of that, also minimize our environmental impact against the tools that we have available. So taking each one of those in turns, what do we mean by these appropriate safety measures and why, again, is that important? Safety measures should be proportionate to the hazard. It is very easy, and we have often seen, that the safety measures applied, they do, they can limit the working time with the, uh, with the waste that you're looking at. They can mandate remote working, and they can restrict that operational facility. So what we want to try and do with the, that waste-led decommissioning approach is maximise the, uh, the amount of um, working time that you can have with the waste. We want to minimise that amount of, uh, of remote working, try to minimise the amount of uh, additional equipment, which it in itself will then become waste at the end of the project. And we want to maximise that operational efficiency against the appropriate safety regime for your uh, decommissioning operation. Ultimately, to do this, you need to work to understand and know what your waste is. So when we're talking then about optimizing the waste routes, what are we talking about? We're talking about maximizing diversion from assets with limited capability. The obvious example here from a UK context is the great work that the uh, low level waste repository and now uh, nuclear waste services are doing when it comes to diverting waste from the LLWR. We want to maximize use of free release. So it's about ensuring that the materials that we've got can then go back into the uh, supply chain or where they were without having to undergo further processing. It's about maximizing the use of decontamination and recycle so that you're minimizing the volumes of waste available. And you're minimizing the use of that uh, geological disposal and low level waste repository. 
It's about ultimately driving your waste through the most economical and the most readily available waste processing routes without clogging up the specialist areas. But again, to do that, you need to understand what your waste is in the first place and optimize its routes. And when we're talking about the best available techniques, this is a process. It's a mandated process, and it's about identifying what are the safe disposal routes. But to be able to understand what the best disposal routes are, again, you need to understand what the waste is that you've got and understand what the techniques are out there that can have the capability to process, dispose, or store those wastes. So that knowledge about uh, your waste, again, is essential. To understanding how to uh, to take the uh, to take the waste led decommissioning option forward, and then when we're talking about cost effective solutions, we start talking about what it you know disposal of these costs, uh, disposal of wastes, and disposal and processing costs are high. From the GGF costing estimates, you know the ILW cost per meter cubed is about twenty eight thousand pounds, and you compare that to sort of average costs depending on the routes for low level waste that's a significant delta and so there is an element here about if you know what your waste is you can sentence it identify what are the best disposal routes and 20k per meter cubed that is a lot of funding to try and identify what the best routes are and finally we can talk about minimizing that environmental impact in many ways the result of the areas we've already talked about. But when we start looking at individual activities, so if we're looking at about transport, the need for the need for transport, the need for stores, avoiding stores if you if you can. You know, the number of ILW stores or low-level waste stores that we've got around the country, um, if we can divert and avoid the costs associated with those, not only are we saving money, but we're also saving on that environmental impact because those stores themselves at a later date will become waste. We're looking at the operating efficiency, the double handling, the elaborate, the, the need for remote solutions. Again, as I just said, those solutions will become waste at the end of the day. But if we can simplify because we've got the right safety in place, then you know, the environmental impact in itself is, uh, is minimized. And finally, when we're looking at disposal, maximizing free release, maximizing recycle, these are all preferable to the alternatives of storing with, whilst waiting for GDF, or even to a certain extent going to LLWR or other landfill. But again, to do all of this, you need to understand and know the waste that you are trying to deal with. So what's the characteris characterization challenge associated with all of this? And what are we actually seeing in the, uh, in the marketplace at the moment? In other areas, and bearing in mind that, uh, that the only undertake activities in, in other sectors in, and, and as well as the nuclear area um, and with other parts of our business, we are seeing that in many areas, a lack of on-site facilities um, or not necessarily having a, a challenge in priorities is leading to long sample turnaround times off-site. That in itself, has the potential to lead to local delivery impacts. And what we mean by that is delays on site. We're not necessarily getting the efficient turnaround of decommissioning activities whilst we're awaiting for the um, for sample turnaround and to actually understand what is the waste that we're looking at. We're seeing that there is sometimes a, a challenge between the balance between the use of off and on site facilities. What are the core and the most pressing priorities that drive the use of your uh, your current on-site facilities. And sometimes there's, there's also challenges with respect to the measurement data interpretation and the intelligence around the information that you've got. Understanding what's necessarily in, a, in, in one drum doesn't necessarily give you the whole picture. And there can be tools and techniques by which you can get greater fidelity from that information. And finally, in some cases, we find that and particularly when it comes to, to power generation, the focus is actually on power generation. Parallel activities, especially concerning things like decommissioning, which, can, which in theory can be put on hold or aren't necessarily seen as, as a priority. You can find that there are delays occurred in that, uh, that kind of area too. And particularly in the decommissioning arena, all this is often happening while the on-site labs themselves need to be, uh, um, need to be decommissioned. 
So there are decisions to be made. At what point do you stop your on-site facility? And at what point do you need to look elsewhere for these services? Noting that in some of these cases, it's not necessarily access to people, but the facilities themselves that can be the challenge. So where are the opportunities for uh, innovation? So often, we, from what we're seeing, it is about maximizing that information from current inf in instrumentation. And uh, without trying to uh, steal Julian's thunder, you know, we are seeing opportunities where uh, this can be, uh, can be done. We're looking at new testing and development techniques, particularly around some of the challenging uh, isotopes, but also recognizing that as the decommissioning challenge changes, so in the nuclear context can the hazard associated with those uh, decommissioning challenges. As you're starting to move away sometimes from the nuclear hazard and more into the sort of the conventional hazards concerning things like asbestos or other, other activities. And the other things concerning um, establishing of those local accredited facilities. Now, how can, are there opportunities within there to be able to be looking at, not necessarily taking the, the sample to the lab, but the lab to the samples when the, when the uh, volume is large enough? And again, uh, Julian will be giving examples of, in many ways, where we have just done that. Thanks, Garrett. Hello, everybody. I'm very happy to speak to you from Chasse-sur-Rhône, near Lyon, in France. I imagine that some of you know the Vallée du Rhône, famous for these great wines. But hey, it seems that's not the topic today. So, Garrett said it before, knowing waste is a key to being able to treat and dispose of it in the right way. This is why the ability to analyze it whatever is composition of nature is essential. But it's not only that. Knowing nuclear waste from the beginning to the end of its life cycle is crucial. For this, at VNS, in addition to our means of measurement and characterization, we can call on two of our core capabilities. Being an industrial operator, as well as running on-site services for key clients. In my experience, it's essential to be able to plan and construction site as close as possible to the waste. By making the link between the final analysis and the construction site, you can guarantee the quality of the sampling. What does that mean? Good sampling guarantees the representativeness of the sample and therefore produces a quality result. This guarantees the right volume or the right mass of the test sample and therefore, an analysis can be carried out according to the requirement of the associated standard. It guarantees being able to meet deadlines. We give ourselves every chance of being able to carry out a quality analysis in good condition. It's also rationalization of transport cost, paying only for the quantity necessary for the analysis. And this is why the knowledge of waste from its birth is essential. But knowing the fate of the waste is also essential. VNS is responsible for the operation of all ANDRA, National Agency for Radioactive Waste Management, processing and storage sites. Garrett spoke about time issues in decommissioning. Knowing the final outlet for waste means mastering the acceptation criteria for storage and treatment centers, both at the physical chemical level and from a packaging point of view. And not insignificant, it also means mastering the administrative part of acceptance file. Having a perfect understanding of waste, its nature, and above all the measurement and characterization needs allows for appropriate treatment and safe storage. All this make it possible to guarantee the acceptance of the waste in the storage centers, and thus to avoid refusal with all the associated costs in terms of transport, sorting or reconditioning of the waste, and therefore time. Let's return what, to what interests us more particularly, the measurement and characterization of our waste. How can we ensure that these steps are carried out correctly? How to guarantee and demonstrate quality results? Measurement and characterization is a vast field, from the design of talon-made measurement system to computer modeling to laboratory analysis. To understand 
what a measurement and characterization lab looks like, please, let me introduce my lab. Above all, we are accredited by French Accreditation Committee, according to standard 17025. We are also authorized to work by the ISN, which is the French Nuclear Safety Authority, per year and carries out around 20,000 separate analyses on them. Our expertise lies in the analysis of complex matrices suitable for dismantling, such as um, concrete, metal, glass, or even graphite. We use techniques specific to nuclear measurement, such as alpha-beta counting, alpha and gamma spectrometry, as well as liquid sentiation. A large, a large part of our skills also fall into the field of chemistry. This is why we use the following device, ICPMS, GCMS, ionic chromatography. The final analysis methods are those known in other field of chemistry, but it is on the preparation of the sample that everything depends. Quality is a question of skills and experience. So uh, I can pass up the opportunity to introduce my team to you. Paul is a physicist, specialist in gamma measurement, but he also managed scintillation for beta, and he is our expert in sample preparation. I imagine we'll talk about this again, but when analyzing waste, the matrices are complex, diverse, sometimes unidentified, and this is why sample preparation plays a key role in the analysis. Germain and Xavier are two chemists specialized in ICPMS and GCMS. Yes, I said chemist. And yes, we are talking about nuclear measurement today. But characterizing waste is above all a chemist job, whether for chemical separation on resin in particular, or for final analysis. And this is very important for us. When we need to innovate, we can call on all of Veolia laboratories to benefit from all this experience. Fatima is our chemical engineer, specializing in, uh, in everything, in fact. She manages the development of method, find solution to be able to analyze complex matrix. You remember concrete, graphite, glass, metal. For example, she has developed a wall method for analyzing tritium in concrete. And not the simplest role, she is our quality manager. All these profiles, all these skills are rare and require time and experience. We consider that a chemist in our field is independent after three years. How can we guarantee an increase in skills? How can we ensure that they are maintained? How can we maintain these skills, this knowledge, this experience. The answer certainly lies in the robustness of a quality system and therefore of accreditation. In my lab, as in all accredited laboratories, the quality system is the center of our operation. We work exclusively with validated, standardized, and if possible, accredited methods, which means that we participate in control studies, collaborating with other accredited labs to test results. We report our discrepancies and address them. We talk about sampling. We do our best to master it and then credit it in our services. We are able to demonstrate the skills of our team. We are able to guarantee the performance of our methods and our devices. In one sentence, accredited laboratories deliver quality results. And this is essential when we talk about areas like nuclear power, waste, or environment. We have no room for error. This is what I have been told as I spent in nuclear power plants at EDF. Do it right the first time. If you remember, we discussed the subject at the start, at the start of our speech. Dismantling can be delayed because of the delay in analysis. By doing it right the first time, we are helping to reduce this delay. However, working under accreditation, according to standard design method, does not mean closing the door to innovation. For many, quality does not necessarily rim with innovation. And yet, by drawing inspiration for what already exists in the world of more traditional waste, how can we quickly offer innovative solutions? Firstly, I will hand over to Garrett to tell us about Veolia's LSML port incinerator. Thank you, Julian. So the first element of our uh, innovation is uh, 
is actually more about learning from other sectors. And in this area, we are talking about the Ellesmere Port Incinerator, which is a, a facilitator, a, the, an incinerator that is operated by Veolia um, in, in the Liverpool area of the UK. And today, we are already processing um, active wastes in the form of naturally occurring radioactive materials or norms, as well as low-level waste. The norms waste itself is generally generated from Veolia operations elsewhere within the oil and gas sector, be that from cleaning of equipment or from uh, decommissioning of, uh, of uh, oil and gas assets. In addition to that, we are working with our colleagues at VE to understand the potential crossover of those technologies. Those technologies associated with the norm waste, act where activities not currently undertaken um, at any scale within the nuclear sector are used regularly for the processing of these lower activity wastes. This could include, for example, high pressure water jetting, which we are aware has been uh, trialled within the UK, as well as uh, other techniques that um, are used within uh, the oil and gas sector for the decontamination of the internals of some of the more con complex capabilities of, and assets. In addition to that, we are working with our colleagues at uh, in Veolia Environmental, who are currently going through a process of analysing and investigating what are they going to do with their laboratories as through a technical refresh um, exercise and recognising, as we said earlier, that there is now a potential for uh, the crossover between that hazardous waste requirement for uh, asset um, for asset and waste characterisation with the uh, characterization of active wastes. Together, they could potentially provide a, a powerful asset when it comes to characterization capabilities moving forward. So pulling those together, our technologies have the capability to benefit both has waste and the nuclear sector, which I think is also potentially of, uh, of significant importance, given the wide range, actually, of uh, people attending our uh, from our audience today. At this point, I'll hand back to Julien, who can uh, tell us about some of the innovation that uh, he's undertaking with his team out in France. Thank you. As we saw previously, for certain problems, we do not start from scratch, but we adapt solutions developed by Veolia in the areas of traditional waste or water. But some problems require pure innovation. This is why I wanted to quickly talk to you about Terrara, an online alpha and beta measurement solution. Usually, liquid sample measurements are performed by gamma spectrometry. All the radionuclides cannot be detected, like pure beta emitters or low intensity gamma emitters, and it needs to be completed by laboratory measurements, like alpha and beta counting. Therefore, this increased delays and cost. What are the prerequisites for this new technology? Detector must be able to detect alpha and beta particles and to stay in water for a long time. Moreover, chemical properties of the liquid should not reduce detector performance. It's also necessary to counteract the strong attenuation of alpha particles in water with a large detection surface to increase geometric efficiency. Finally, Electronics may be able to discriminate signal coming from alpha and beta particles. It's why Con Company and the University of Padova developed the Tewara RTM device, tap weather radioactivity real-time monitoring. Why VNS, which is responsible for carrying out tests to define the performance and limitation of the device. These tests are led by Deborah de Grel. At first, the aim was to control tape water, but potential uses were quickly found in the nuclear industry and in the event of a serious accident. Terrara positioned itself in addition to gamma spectrometry by offering rapid measurement, allowing immediate actions to be taken. It used ZNS and plastic scintillators. ZNS detect alpha and beta particles, and plastic detect beta particles. Both can, be, both can be immersed in water and can be produced in large scale. Today, Terrara demonstrated convincing performances consistent with needs. However, contamination problem remains on ZNS, and the plastic is sensitive to gamma radiation. 
And in the event of significant gamma flux, shielding may be necessary. Testing continues at VNS. I would also like to tell you about a project that is close to my heart, and which concerns the adaptation of an existing concept to the world of radioactive waste. For me, it's one of the best solutions for measurement and characterization linked to dismantling. Let me tell you about Neomab. It's a Veolia concept, which consists of creating a lab in a container in order to be able to intervene directly on the site and the construction site. The idea was born from a project with um, several problems to solve. Sample very difficult to transport due to their activity or their nature. Complex or even unknown matrices making transport even more complicated. The same matrices we did not make it possible to clearly define a preparation protocol before the analysis and therefore to clearly define a sample volume. We started from this idea and from feedback from various mobile labs in operation, such as the one in Ghana, to adapt it to the need of radioactive waste feedback and the mobile lab in Ghana. On the Anglogol Ashanti mining site, Veolia is responsible for the management of mining and refining wastewater. The goal was to find the most accurate, rapid, and economically reliable on-site measurement solution. This is how the Neomad by Veolia concept was born, drawing on the potential of Veolia system South Africa, which set up lab in containers. The project took around a year to be deployed from the first course to the operational laboratory on site. Without post-COVID and various visa and custom problems, we can estimate that the deployment time could have been half, nearly six months. This lab is equipped with, for the analysis of ion chromatography for anions and cations, ICPOES for metals, TOC meter, and for the preparation of the samples, ultra pure water system, mineralizer for acid attack, nitrogen generator with compressor for the TOC meter. It's completely autonomous. This lab has not been operating successfully without interruption for over a year. Raw water, extremely charged and very variable, must be treated by reverse osmosis. And the analysis from the Neomab lab gives operator complete and rapid ionic analysis necessary for precise control of the treatment process, which make it possible to maximize performance while reducing the risk of mobile clogging. The results are therefore extremely positive, both on the performance side and on the financial side. This innovative mobile lab concept, I said mobile, but I mean transportable rather than mobile. It was created to meet analysis needs at a competitive cost with the flexibility to move to a new seat when needed. If you remember, Gareth raised the problem with the decommissioning of analytical laboratories. This is an answer. The lab allows for a wide range of analysis to be carried out on and off-site in a container with state-of-the-art equipment to carry out measurement and characterization of waste at a cooperatively low cost while complying with all relevant regulations. To sum up, Neobab is a mobile laboratory dedicated to analysis and completely adaptable to the customer's need. Reducing cost. The balance between the cost associated with subcontracting and transport versus maintaining a dedicated on-site facility, which will need to be decommissioned. Minimizing risk, including the program impact by minimizing the complexity added to the characterization process by sending samples off-site for work. Providing flexibility, being able to ramp up or down characterization capability efficiently, the lab is dedicated to your need. 
maintaining control. Maintaining the control on site to prioritize the characterization of sample, which maximize your mission efficiency. Embedded quality system. In conjunction with the VNS lab, the mobile lab benefits from its accreditation, its experience, its quality system, and the skills of its teams, which can be deployed within the lab. In conclusion, with more than 300 Veolia laboratories around the world of all size and in all sectors, Neomab is designed by laboratories and now specifically adapted to the nuclear world. Thank you all for joining today's webinar on advanced approaches to nuclear measurement and characterization. Your engagement and curiosity drives the advancement of this field. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to share um, and learn alongside such a distinguished audience. Uh, let's continue the conversation. Thank you.